Good morning, Stephen. Thank you so much for making time to talk to me today in this very busy week. Pleasure, Michaela. So I want to start this interview, which is for the Fizzy newsletter, um, by acknowledging that we're meeting on Aboriginal land and pay my respects to Aboriginal elders, communities, um, and the care they have taken for the lands that we live on and also for communities um, and how much we have to learn from them. Um, and that it's a really important part of Fizzy's work to be thinking all the time about everything we do about how we can improve um, Aboriginal empowerment for communities so that they can lead the way forward. So Stephen, the, um, you've had an incredibly um, long and extensive career, both in Australia and in Canada, in, um, in, in, in health systems, in leading and transforming health systems. You're a health economist and as I was looking through, you know, your bio and thinking about this, Royal Commission um, final report was released yesterday. You come with an incredibly unique and broad perspective to that. You're, um, you've been the secretary of what's now the Commonwealth Department of Health. So you've held that leadership role that will be part of the transformation. You're currently the health program director at the Grattan Institute. You're also on... RMIT Council, Chair of the Eastern Melbourne Primary Health Network and a member of the Brotherhood of St Lawrence Board. So community sector, health um, sector and an educational institution, uh, you're, I know, very active member of all of those. So very keen to hear what your thoughts are, because I know how closely you've been following this, on, on the report and the recommendations. Fizzy is particularly interested in, in it from what are the implications from a workforce perspective, but all of the all of the recommendations are so um, connected. Really keen to hear what your high level response is today. So, Michaela, thanks very much for that. And uh, I'd also acknowledge that I'm on the unceded lands of the Rundry people here in my little office at home. So, I think I'd just pull you up a second. I don't think we should start with the workforce perspectives, although you did say everything's interlinked. What is transformational about the Royal Commission and what needs to be transformational about the Royal Commission is changing the whole frame of aged care. So it's about the rights of the, 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 the older person, a right to access, a right to decent care, a right to dignity. There's a whole lot of things there that are really, really important now. The point is, you can only get there if you've got a competent, empowered, adequate workforce. Yeah. So the workforce is a critical, really, really critical enabler. In all of these health community services area, the quality that a person, that a client, a consumer, a patient experiences is critically determined by the workforce. Now, there are a number of elements of workforce that I'm happy to talk about, but you know, there's there's the qualifications of the workforce, absolutely critical of some of the work Fizzy is doing. What the Royal Commission has said, what we said in our reports at Grattan on this, is that at the minimum, people should have a certificate three, that they, they should have a preparation which helps them address and, and understand that, you know, doing something for a person is not the same as doing something with a person and enabling them to, to actually live in, as independently as possible. Now, there's something that's a real problem, I think, for government, is that a certificate three is not a certificate three is not a certificate three. Although, you know, it's all regulated and we've got these competency standards, competency standards in human services, people facing professions are often very, very difficult. And although it can be done, I think one of the things that one of the policy issues, which is a tertiary education, vocational education mm. uh, sort of policy issue is how do we ensure that the quality of those uh, Cert 3s yes. is really good? And I don't think government has got its head around that yet, but that's another issue. But that qualification issue, once we have, or as we move to a Cert 3 certified workforce, then the pay is going to go up. We know that across every industry, as qualifications increase, pay increases. 
then how is that going to be paid? The government's going to have to pay the proprietors more. It's got to have to ensure that that money goes into the pockets of the staff, not the pockets of the proprietor. So there's this, this critical question of improving qualifications. There's a, a second issue about the number of staff. We heard time and time again that there's just inadequate staff. There's a study comparing the star rating system in the US, five star rating, to here, and only 7%, I think it is, of providers in the four and five levels, and you know, 93% or whatever are in the lower levels. And you know, what is the certainly two and one are not the are not right, is it the right one, three or four? But certainly we've got to increase the number of care minutes that are being provided. And that also includes registered nurse supervision. The 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 sleeper in in this is that we've framed this issue as one of staff ratios and staff supervision issues. The issue of the casualization of the workforce, critical issue in COVID, has not been brought across into this discussion of uh, residential aged care, for example. And casualization means that people don't know the, the residents that they're caring for, and that impacts on quality as well. So there's a, and on top of that, there's more pay. And so there's a whole lot of stuff here, really, really important workforce issues that we're talking about here in the, uh, in the report. So Stephen, the, the question, one of the critical questions then too, I'd absolutely agree with you about the breadth of the issues and how you, how you tackle this kind of complexity is leadership. What's the an implementation of driving driving that level of change that has so many different um, stakeholders as part of part of the conversation? What are from the leadership roles you've you've held in thinking about what's going to be important in 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 leading and driving this transformation? What are your reflections on on those sorts of leadership issues? So, Michaela, good question, and and it's got so many levels of answers that I can't possibly. But you know, we've got to get the national leadership right, and I think we should have a separate aged care commission to do that. We've got to get leadership in the organisation right, and so you've got to actually strengthen mm. the boards of governance and so on. You've got to get the leadership of the of the service right, uh, and which means you've got to have staff first of all. And one of my aphorisms or something I learned from one of the CEOs I worked with was you select on the basis of values and more or less everything else can be trained. And I don't quite think that's true, but it's pretty close to true. And if you start by saying we need leaders in our residential aged care facilities who are absolutely committed to aged care as a vocation as something they want to look after old people. They want to look or they want to care with older people. They want to, this is where they want to be. They, they're they not in the childcare. Some people want to work with kids. Some people, you know, want to work with people with disabilities. Some people want to work with aged care, with people who are older. So we've got to have people who, who really want to do that and they have to be appropriately remunerated for that. We shouldn't say, Oh, because you want to work with aged care people and the society is ageist, we're not going to pay you anything. You know, we've got to actually be making sure that we can attract the right sort of people who are committed. And then we've got to help them do that job. We've got to actually help them with leadership training. We've got to help them with uh, the right governance arrangements. We've got to help them uh, with staff development and so on. I, I think that um, thinking through all of those levels of leadership and how we support them is um, something that the community sector in particular has not had a history of investing in um, very well. So there's, there's a, there's a, as you say, there's multiple fronts that need to be tackled. But Yeah, but, but Michaela, can I just interrupt? What happens is people are a, a good nurse or a good care worker and they get promoted yes. and are put into a situation where they're, they're set up to fail. They're not supported yes. and not the sister, I don't think you have to have everybody perfectly trained before they take a role, but you have to say this person is going to grow into this role. We're going to mentor them. We're going to actually give them time off to a grad dip or a grad cert in whatever and help them do the very best they can 
but they can't do it without being equipped and having the tools to do it. Yeah. Yes, so those pathways, the career and learning pathways, um, the report does refer to that, the need to, to build those, but fairly light touch reference to that. Um, it's a space that needs a lot more work. Indeed. So thank you very much. This is a conversation that I think we could talk about for the rest of the day, and I will be interested to, to, to come back to you when we have heard a bit more about how this plays out, Stephen. Thank you very much for your time today. Pleasure, Carol.